Chapter 281 Draco's Arrogance, Voldemort is going to attack Azkaban? The atmosphere in the classroom became more subtle, but Draco didn't seem to notice it. He flipped through a few pages of defensive magical theory and said, Lucas, maybe Professor Umbridge has her own way? We can't be so quick to deny her teaching methods without giving them a chance, can we? Draco looked the same as usual when he said those words. He had just finished speaking when Crabbe and Goyle both nodded in agreement. Pansy Parkinson, Blaze Zabini, and others also supported Draco's point of view. Lucas had yet to say anything when Umbridge's big toad-like face showed a wide smile. Mr. Malfoy is right. I do have follow-up teaching plans. Her gaze swept over the faces of Draco and the others. In her mind, she secretly matched them with their parents among the Death Eaters, and it occurred to her that these people might become her helpers at Hogwarts. It's just that she hasn't figured out how to reveal her identity to these children yet. At this moment, everyone's attention was no longer on Umbridge, but on Lucas and Draco. Not to mention the shrewd snakes, the Hufflepuff students, could also feel the strange atmosphere between the two. Since you said so, Draco, let's wait and see. Seeing that Lucas chose to give in, Umbridge's eyes lit up. Then let's continue our course. Today we will read the content of the basic theory of entry. Not long after, when the class finally ended, the students couldn't wait to rush out of the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom. Almost all of them had strong dissatisfaction and disgust on their faces. And the ones who didn't are just because they have very good control of not showing it outwardly. They read the first chapter over and over throughout the class in order to memorize it. Now they just wanted to go to the Great Hall to find some juice to moisten their throats. Mr. Draco Malfoy, please stay behind. A voice thinner than that of a girl came from behind. Draco frowned slightly, giving the others a look. Professor, what can I do for you? Facing umbrage, Draco showed the arrogance of a top pure-blood family heir to the fullest. Although such a performance will provoke umbrage's disgust, it will definitely not cause her suspicion. Seeing the same posture as the old Malfoy, the smile on Umbridge's face became more obvious. Can I call you Draco? I'm very good friends with your father, Lucius Malfoy. Of course, Draco nodded slightly with a generous expression on his face. Umbridge noticed his subtle show of superiority even though it wasn't obvious, and it made Draco's impression on her mind go crazy. But even so, the warm smile on her face didn't fade a bit. Draco, what do you think of Lucas Grindelwald? As soon as the words came out, Draco's eyes became vigilant. He's a good friend. This answer obviously did not satisfy Umbridge. Noticing the wariness in Draco's eyes, she whispered again, Don't worry, your father and I are very good friends. You can trust me. When speaking of the word friends, she also specially emphasized it. Finally, she held her left arm with her right hand. Seeing the series of actions, Draco's eyes softened a lot, but he was more vigilant than before. Unexpectedly, Lucas guessed right, Umbridge was also a Death Eater. It turns out that this is such an important matter. You should have said it earlier. What did you ask me just now? What do you think of Lucas Grindelwald? After being reminded by her, Draco suddenly said, has power, has brains, has a great personality, and he's a very good partner in business. That's it, Umbridge asked suspiciously. Right, that is it. Seeing Draco's affirmative nod, Umbridge looked thoughtful. Draco, I still need more help from you at school. In this Hogwarts castle, I am too weak alone. That's simple. If it is to deal with some simple things, I am willing to serve the professor. If you have anything you don't understand, you can also ask me. Umbridge nodded in satisfaction. She likes children who understand things, like this. It's good to have your promise. I will write a letter to Minister Thickness later. I believe we will have the opportunity to cooperate soon. Umbridge winked at him when she finished. Draco really didn't expect this. Fortunately, his acting skills are not bad, and he didn't let the pink toad see the disgust he was feeling. Professor, if there is nothing else, I will go back first. After saying his farewell, Draco turned and walked out quickly. But just as he was about to walk out of the classroom, Umbridge said mysteriously, Draco, have you ever thought about becoming the chief of the Slytherin house? The footsteps that had already stepped out of the classroom suddenly stopped. Draco looked back. No, 
I don't think anyone can take away the position of house chief from Lucas. Looking at the distant figure, Umbridge laughed. She could see clearly just now that Draco's eyes were full of ambition. As long as he has this ambition, maybe I can take advantage of it. After saying that, Umbridge laughed again. That kind of shrill laughter with a choked girly voice sounded really creepy. Many students passing by the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom quickened their pace and fled in fear. Draco frowned as he returned to the common room. Umbridge's last words gave him a bad feeling, so he wanted to talk to Lucas and remind him to be careful. But as soon as he entered the common room, he saw many people signing up for something around Astoria, and Lucas was also answering questions from the crowd. In this situation, it wouldn't be easy for Draco to go directly to Lucas. If it was before, it would be nothing if he dragged him away directly. But not now, in the eyes of everyone, their relationship is in a delicate state at the moment. Draco took another look at Lucas, who was surrounded by the crowd, so he had to find another time to talk to him about it. In a luxurious residence in Little Hangleton, Voldemort was scanning the subordinates in front of him. What's going on with the Dementors? Master, the Dementors hunters have returned to the Ministry of Magic at this time, and those who communicated with them reported that they are willing to serve you. That's a good job, Lucius, Voldemort said flatly. Meeting Voldemort's terrifying red eyes, Lucius Malfoy quickly lowered his head. It's all with the help of the master's reputation. I'm just running errands. What Voldemort liked most about Lucius was that he was self-aware and could speak nicely. That's right, let's go ahead and attack Azkaban during the Christmas holidays to welcome our companions back. At that time, let the Dementors cause some trouble for the Ministry of Magic. By the way, you go and inquire about the prophecy from more than ten years ago. I need to know the full content of the prophecy so that I can find a way to completely eliminate Harry Potter. Lucius Malfoy replied respectfully, All prophecies will be recorded in the prophecy balls and kept in the prophecy hall of the Department of Mysteries of the Ministry of Magic. Nagini, on Christmas night, you go and bring back the prophecy ball, treat it as a warm-up before the attack on Azkaban. Hearing Voldemort's order, Nagini the serpent nodded slightly. Seeing the big snake beside Voldemort, there was a look of fear on the Death Eater's face. This big snake is really strong, and more importantly, its venom will slow down the speed of wound healing. During this time, the Death Eaters have seen many people die from the loss of blood because of the serpent. Voldemort saw everyone's terrified expressions, and with a smile on his face, he raised his left hand and stroked Nagini's head. He has always believed that proper deterrence would make his subordinates more loyal. When Astoria handed over the list of the study group registrations, Lucas didn't expect that there would be so many people. My lord, these people have taken an unbreakable vow, and they will never reveal anything about the study group. Seeing Astoria's expression like she was asking for praise, Lucas patted her head. Good job, thank you. I was just doing what I could. Astoria shook her head shyly, but soon her expression became a little disappointed, and after a while she said, My lord, please don't blame my sister, I will go to persuade her. What? Lucas asked suspiciously. My sister has been staying with Draco Malfoy recently, but I will make her see reason. Seeing the little girl's firm eyes, Lucas suddenly didn't know how to explain. Forget it, let Daphne take care of the headache. He believed that Daphne, as a sister, should have a way to deal with her little sister. The next day arrived in the blink of an eye. Someone from the newspaper office came to the school early in the morning. The students who passed by the front hall and were about to go to eat showed curious expressions. Only after getting closer did they realize that it was Professor Umbridge who had been promoted. Now, she is not only the Professor of Defense Against the Dark Arts, but also the first High Inquisitor of Hogwarts. No one has ever heard of this position. However, it can also be seen from the title that Umbridge, as the Inquisitor, will have way more power in the school. Chapter 282 The Contest Between the Toad Inquisitor and the Dungeons Bat, a duo that never disappoints. The magic camera was constantly flashing as Umbridge stood in the foyer beaming. Senior Undersecretary Umbridge, may I ask, does your appointment as a High Inquisitor this time 
mean that the Ministry of Magic will fully intervene in the Hogwarts education system. Please call me Inquisitor Umbridge. In fact, the Ministry of Magic has been seeking educational reforms, and I, as the first High Inquisitor. Looking at Umbridge who was delivering a long speech, Harry asked in puzzlement, What does a High Inquisitor even do? Judging from the orders issued by the Ministry of Magic, the responsibilities are very comprehensive. Fred, or is it George? Maybe Gred, let's just leave it as one of the twins, appeared next to Harry at some point. He also looked at the boastful umbrage in the distance, with deep disgust in his eyes. Guys, guess what I heard? The other Weasley twin came from the other side. No wonder Harry didn't see him just now. It turned out he was there to gather information. Seeing the three pairs of curious eyes, George smiled and said, I have found out about the High Inquisitor. It's really scary. This position not only has the power to supervise students, but even faculty members. As long as she feels that the faculty members are not suitable for Hogwarts, she can report to the Ministry of Magic. Some professors may be expelled this time. George patted his chest, looking frightened. Hearing his words, Ron immediately showed a gloating expression. It would be great if she could start with Snape. As soon as he finished speaking, he saw Lucas walking from a distance. Lucas. Harry wanted to ask about Dumbledore's condition, but Lucas walked straight into the Great Hall without even looking at him. Harry, who felt like he was hit again, had no choice but to follow up with his friends. At the Ravenclaw long table, while eating breakfast, Lucas reminded the four girls, Don't forget about tonight. I've already told you the password for the Slytherin common room. Remember to come early. Don't worry, we will go together when the time comes. Hermione replied on behalf of the others as the first girlfriend. Tonight will be the first official activity of the study group. Lucas has already found a place, which is in the Slytherin Chamber of Secrets. There's no place more secure than Salazar Slytherin's Sanctuary. It's a pity that neither the Secret Garden nor the Library of Rowena are suitable for others to know about. Godric's Treasure Room is even more unsuitable. Not to mention that the place is not big enough and it is full of valuables. After much deliberation, only the Slytherin Chamber of Secrets meets the requirements. First of all, it is underground and it cannot be opened without parcel tongue. Secondly, it is big enough and also very empty. And most importantly, Salazar's laboratory is very well hidden. He doesn't worry about the others finding it, and even if they find out, they may not be able to open it. After breakfast, everyone began to go to their classes. After dealing with the reporters, Umbridge quickly got into work. She was acting very nosy everywhere on campus, having fun interrupting young couples who wanted to kiss, probably wanting to get revenge on Lucas for saying she had no power. After she became the Inquisitor, she even wanted to control which foot the students stepped into the classroom first. If before her new position, she wasn't very welcome, now she became hated by the whole school teachers and students. History of Magic Classroom Looking at Cuthbert Binns on the podium, talking about his textbooks, Ron said speechlessly, Why didn't Umbridge come to investigate Binns? He obviously has some dementia. Harry smiled lightly, then looked at Lucas. He was keenly aware of the subtle shift in Slytherin House. The Slytherins who were monolithic before now seemed to have a tendency to split into two groups. Then he looked back at Draco. Every time he saw him, he would think of everything that happened in the cemetery. He still couldn't believe that Draco would volunteer to join the Death Eaters. But he had no choice but to believe it. Then he looked at the people beside Draco. Whether it is Pansy Parkinson or Theodore Knott, the parents of these people have all appeared in the cemetery. Not to mention Crab and Goyle, these two were among the first names Voldemort called out back then. Don't look at them. Didn't you say you saw Malfoy join the Death Eaters? That's right. But... Since they are Death Eaters, they are our enemies. Instead of thinking about these messy things, you might as well think about how to deal with the detention you have later. The mention of detention gave Harry a headache. Thinking of Umbridge's malicious stare at the start of term feast made him feel like he was doomed this time. The drowsy history of magic class finally came to an end. After lunch, they had double potion classes in the afternoon. The whole day of class today was dreadful. 
The fifth years went to the dungeons. As they stepped through the doors of the potions classroom, at a glance, they saw a toad in a pink cardigan sitting in the last row of the classroom, her clothes making her stick out like a sore thumb in the gloomy classroom, having to meet two of the most annoying professors at the same time. One can imagine the student's mood at the moment. Sit in your seat quickly. A soft, whisper-like voice reached everyone's ears. Waiting until everyone was seated, just as Professor Snape was about to speak, Umbridge in the last row asked, Professor Snape, do you allow couples to sit together in your class? The latest educational decree I issued this morning stipulates that excessive intimacy between couples is prohibited in class and in public places. Lucas looked at the toad behind him blankly and got a provocative look in response. Hermione patted her boyfriend on the shoulder. Don't be angry. It's not worth offending the Ministry of Magic over such a trivial matter. After she finished speaking, she kissed Lucas on the cheek, picked up her school bag, and walked towards the Ravenclaw group. Seeing the two finally compromise, Umbridge immediately showed a smug toad look. Little did she know that her appearance at the moment was exactly what Lucas wanted to see. Well, he didn't want to see her, but that's the reaction he wanted from her. Because Lucas was too strong before, the relationship between the two was hostile. All he has to do now is to show his weakness and let Umbridge turn her attention towards Harry. Now he just needs to wait until she wants to deal with Harry. That's when his plans for Umbridge and Harry Potter start. Now we start the class. What we need to make today is the strengthening solution. Professor Snape's voice was still slick. It's just that there was a little more anger in his tone today. The potion's function and the brewing method are all on the blackboard, and the materials have been placed on your desktop. Don't stand still now. Start brewing the potion. I don't want to talk about it a second time. The students hurriedly lowered their heads and got busy. Umbridge looked around at everyone's performance and then wrote and drew in her tiny girlish notebook. After all this was done, she came to Professor Snape again. It seems that they are quite esoteric, but I have doubts about strengthening solutions. Are they really suitable for learning such dangerous potions? I will be making comments to the Ministry of Magic on this point, and I am sure the Ministry will be happy to remove it from the textbooks. Well, Professor Snape was offended by Umbridge's words. Seeing the toad walking towards him, Snape turned and walked towards the desk where Neville and Seamus were. For Neville, Snape was the nightmare of a lifetime. The bat's gaze almost caused him to pour the salamander's blood into the cauldron ahead of time. Fortunately, Seamus beside him stopped him right in time, and a trace of regret flashed across Snape's eyes. Then he turned around and reminded, Professor Umbridge, I think it's better for you to stand back. These dunderheads whose heads have been stepped on by a troll often blow up their cauldron. Umbridge didn't heed Professor Snape's advice. She was busy recording the areas where potions could be improved in the notebook. How long have you been working at Hogwarts? Fourteen years. I heard that you applied for the Defense Against the Dark Arts professorship during the summer, did you? Yes. Snape replied in a low voice, but his gaze was still fixed on Neville, continuing to put pressure on him. You've applied for Defense Against the Dark Arts many times since you entered school, haven't you? That's right. Snape was a little annoyed, because of the toad beside him, and because of Neville. Seeing that Umbridge's questions were coming to an end, Lucas drew his wand and pointed it to Neville. Neville's arm was hit by a curse and suddenly went numb, and the blood of the salamander tightly held in his hand finally fell into the cauldron. Seeing the potion in the cauldron turn from turquoise to orange and making a horrible hissing noise, Neville suddenly had a bad feeling in his heart. This feeling is so familiar, he has this premonition every time he's in front of a cauldron. Neville, you. Seamus didn't have time to think about it, so he pulled out his wand and used a vanishing charm on the cauldron, hoping to vanish the contents before it exploded. But as the demolitions expert of Hogwarts, Seamus never disappoints. Professor Snape, who stepped back two steps ahead, had already drawn his wand. With the earth-shattering sound, the potion in the cauldron splashed around. The students around were already used to it, 
and skillfully took out their wands to protect themselves. But Umbridge, who didn't fully understand the Neville Seamus duo, suffered a disaster. Her exposed skin began to swell rapidly after touching the potion, and after a while her body became strangely shaped, looking even more like a toad if that was even possible. You idiot, you screwed up again, Neville Longbottom, and this time you lost zero points. Professor Snape ignored the ugly toad beside him, but scolded Neville sharply and cleaned up the criminal evidence by the way. Ah! Umbridge glanced at herself in the mirror, screamed and ran out of the classroom. Her departure made everyone breathe a sigh of relief. This included Professor Snape. A good potions lesson is always short. Maybe it's because Umbridge was dealt with, but for the first time in forever, the students walked out of the potions classroom with a smile on their faces. The time slowly came to nine o'clock in the evening. All the snakes who took the unbreakable vow came to the common room. This also includes Lucas's four girlfriends. Everyone was very curious about the place where Lucas said that they could cast magic safely without being found. At the same time, Harry had just finished his detention and walked out of Umbridge's office with blood on his hands. This made him hate the new professor and at the same time make up his mind to resist that toad. Chapter 283, Lesson 1, Killing Curse, Dumbledore's Army Established Master Lord Chief, everyone is here. After counting the number of people, Astoria came to Lucas. Thanks for your hard work. Lucas walked up to the crowd. Nearly 80% of the people in Slytherin House have signed up for the study group, and this gave him great satisfaction. Everyone, starting today, we will have two days of practical teaching every week. But before that, I need to make a statement. All the magic I teach is extremely dangerous, and you are absolutely not allowed to use it on people other than the enemy. Yes, Chief. N. Lucas raised his hand to check the time. It was nine o'clock sharp. There was a grinding sound on the wall behind him. Seeing that there is actually a hidden door in the common room, the others were surprised. Chief, is this? Marcy Flint asked curiously. This is her last year at Hogwarts. As the seventh year's chief, she brought almost all the seventh years to the study group because she understood that once they graduated, they would lose the protection of Hogwarts. In the current situation, if they learn more, they might be able to save their lives at a critical moment. Here is the passage to the Slytherin Chamber of Secrets. They were all startled, and their eyes became thoughtful. The basilisk and hare incident that made a lot of noise three years ago, could it be that it was their chief who did it? Lucas knew what they were thinking, but he didn't bother to explain it. When everyone entered the venue where Harry fought the basilisk along the passage. They noticed the humanoid targets that had been placed in the arena. In addition, there were also some boxes next to the targets. However, the boxes were all covered with black cloth, so no one could see what was inside. Chief, what are we learning today? The novelty passed, and everyone gathered together again. Lucas drew his wand and tapped his palm. Those who can participate in this study group, your abilities are beyond doubt, so let's skip the basics directly. Umbridge seems determined not to teach us practical defensive spells, which is not good news for fifth and seventh year students. So our goal this year, in addition to learning the magic spells that need to be used in actual combat against the enemy, is also to learn the magic spells in Defense Against the Dark Arts textbooks. Today is the first lesson. We will start with the most practical spell, one of the unforgivable curses, the killing curse. Lucas's words caused everyone to exclaim. The students whispered to each other, as if they were a little apprehensive about learning how to kill. My lord, why don't we start with the disarming charm? I remember it was said in the book that the disarming charm is the simplest, most direct and easy to use spell. Many people also wanted to ask this same question. That's a good question. Lucas came to Astoria and continued, because the disarming charm is only suitable for sneak attacks. Use the disarming charm on me. Astoria looked up, saw the encouragement in Lucas' eyes, and slowly raised her wand. Expelliarmus. The red light flew towards Lucas, but it was easily intercepted by the opponent halfway. After the actual demonstration, he looked at the crowd and said, It is undeniable that the disarming spell is the easiest to cast, but will you be able to win if you just knock off the opponent's wand? 
Please remember that actual combat is not a duel, and your opponent will not admit defeat to you just because his wand is knocked into the air. Lucas looked at Astoria again. Use the disarming charm on me again. Expelliarmus. The little girl seemed to be addicted to it and cast the spell at Lucas right after he finished speaking. Seeing Lucas's wand flying into the air, everyone followed the wand and looked up. What are you looking at? Lucas's voice caught everyone's attention and saw that he didn't stop attacking because his wand was knocked into the air. Astoria felt a magic hit her stomach, and then a gentle force made her fly backwards. At the same time, Lucas quickly stepped forward to catch his wand and disarmed Astoria. See, actual combat is not about standing still and waving your wand stupidly. When you relax because you knock the enemy's wand away, the opponent is probably already thinking about how to kill you. Returning the wand to Astoria, Lucas walked up to everyone again and said, The killing curse is equally simple to cast, and you all know the effect. Last year, Professor Moody taught us the unforgivable curses and how to resist the imperious curse. I believe everyone still remembers those lessons. They all nodded one after another. When they personally experienced the imperious curse, only then did they know why the Ministry of Magic declared it an unforgivable curse. Professor Moody once said at the time that the killing curse cannot be resisted. In fact, this statement is not correct. Lucas' words made everyone very puzzled. Casting the killing curse requires a very strong magic power as the foundation. People with insufficient magic power can probably only make people have nosebleeds or spit out two mouthfuls of blood. In addition, the killing curse is not impossible to dodge, but the speed of human beings is usually not as fast as the magic spell. But I can tell everyone with certainty that the killing curse can be blocked. Avada Kedavra the green light illuminated the entire room, and the humanoid target at the side was shattered by the killing curse. Seeing this, they all shivered. For wizards with powerful magic, the killing curse also has good damage ability. Take me as an example. Ordinary wooden doors and stones can't stop my killing curse at all. For elite aura level wizards, wooden shields and metal such as dinner plates are equally unable to stop their killing curses. However, how many people have the strength of the elite aura level? Lucas was sure to tell them, not many. So the way to resist the killing curse is very simple. Have changeable things around you and a good transfiguration spell. Hearing his methods, everyone showed helpless expressions. If transfiguration was so easy to use in battle, each magic school would not have a separate class for it. Lucas chuckled and said, The killing curse kills the one who is hit, and skilled wizards with powerful magic can also exert impressive destructive power. Compared to the disarming charm, the casting action is equally simple, and it also has a strong deterrent effect. No matter how you look at it, casting the killing curse is more suitable than the disarming charm when you're fighting for your life. So for the next period of time, not only do you have to learn the killing curse, you also have to practice speedy transfiguration to make sure that everyone can turn anything into a shield. Today, let's practice the killing curse first. With a wave of Lucas's hand, the boxes covered by the black cloth revealed their true faces. They were all full of live rats in them, and there were more than a dozen boxes. The girls backed away one after another, with disgusted expressions on their faces. These rats are the ones you will train on next, one for each of you. Come on. Among the people in front of them, except for those in the sixth and seventh year, whose magic power barely reached the standard, others still had some difficulty trying to kill the rats successfully in one go. Lucas didn't let them stop practicing once they succeeded. He wanted them to practice until they could use it with a wave at a critical moment. They don't have plot armor like Harry to protect them after all. It's not possible to take the world by using one trick like he did with his Expelliarmus. Thinking of Harry defeating Voldemort with the disarming charm, Lucas felt like it made no sense at all. It was insulting. Avada Kedavra! A green light hit the ground next to a rat making it run away. Seeing Astoria's frustrated expression, Lucas smiled and came to her side. Your movements are wrong, that's why you can't cast the spell properly. After saying that, he held Astoria, wrist and taught her how to swing the wand, this made the little girl shy. 
Of course, his girlfriends did not escape his personal teaching. Lucas looked around, watching the serious expressions on everyone's faces, and showed a satisfied smile. Everything is always difficult at the beginning, and his study group finally took the first step. Through layers of screening, there will be many outstanding talents among these people. The saints also need fresh blood. More than two hours passed, and everyone dragged their tired bodies back to the common room. After sending off his girlfriends, Lucas returned to the Slytherin Chamber of Secrets. A long time passed before Draco walked in with Pansy and others. Really, seeing them learn spells makes me so envious. Hearing Blaze Zabini complaining, Lucas chuckled and said, It's hard work for you to make a trip at such a late hour. What are you talking about? Isn't it hard for you to teach so many people? Draco said with a smile. Letting the others practice the killing curse first, Lucas took Draco aside. Did Umbridge come to find you? Well, she was really stupid enough to ask me if I'm interested in becoming the chief of Slytherin. Has she forgotten the election system for the position? Seeing the disdain in Draco's eyes, Lucas said with a smile. Honestly, if she asks for any help, try to push it to me, the chief of the house, and I plan to make a deal with her. No problem. Draco didn't ask what the deal was. The two briefly exchanged ideas on what to do next, and Lucas suddenly thought of a very important thing. In a few days, you will need to go to Umbridge for a small report. Potter seems to be planning to set up a study group. The name seems to be DA or something. Dumbledore? Draco asked in surprise. Basically, you tell Umbridge the news, but don't agree to any of her requests. Draco answered in the affirmative, and Lucas took him to the practice field. As for where he got the news from, it was naturally revealed by Ginny. There is a Gryffindor girlfriend who is really convenient to inquire about news over there. In a few days, Dumbledore's army was formed. The reason why Harry did this is because Umbridge doesn't teach any useful knowledge. Secondly, it is also because Ron, Seamus, and others were pushing him to do it. Today is the official start of Dumbledore's army classes. Thanks to the help of the twins, Harry managed to find the Room of Requirement. Fred, George, are you really not joining the DA? The twins looked at each other and said, Sorry, we have too many orders. The Skiving snack boxes are very popular, so the rest of our time will be used to complete the orders. Neither had forgotten what Lucas had said before the summer break. He said that this semester he will teach them some useful things, and the two have been eagerly waiting for it. Harry knew in his heart that both of them were just making excuses. He thought that the two were looking down on his own strength, so they didn't want to participate and learn from him. This made him feel a bit of resentment in his heart. He felt that as good friends, the two of them should cheer him on. Seeing the twins walk away, Harry sighed, but when he walked into the room of requirements, he saw his classmates staring at him eagerly, and he suddenly had a thought. Does this count as having a group of followers? Another few days passed. The actions of Umbridge didn't stop. Almost all the professors have been investigated by her, and a second round of investigations will begin today. The first one is Professor Trelawney, who did not do well in the last round. 